Romans 13, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 7 here this morning, looking at our responsibility to the state. Now, this is a very important passage of Scripture because it gives the balance to the topic that we have just covered. At the end of chapter 12, Paul has been warning believers not to take personal vengeance against others who do them harm. And yet the natural question for a person when they hear that particular exhortation, that command given, they read, God is the one that brings vengeance. Then the natural question is, well, then are we going to have to wait until the Lord returns before that judgment or that vengeance occurs? And the answer to that question is no. There are also civil authorities that have been tasked with that issue as well. And that's the balance here in the context. Now, many times when I bring up the issue of responsibility to the state, a Christian sometimes will respond to me by saying, well, do I have any responsibility to the state? I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God, so I have a higher calling. Well, yes, you do. That is correct. But you do also have a responsibility to the state. And that is what Paul lays out here in this text. So let's just read verse 1 of chapter 13. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister. Notice the second time he makes that statement. He is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you may pay taxes, that they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So what is your responsibility to the state? Well, there are several very specific uh, commands given here by the Apostle Paul. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he is writing here, and first he declares that our primary responsibility as individuals living in this country or any country, is that we be subject to the governing authorities. And so he clearly declares, every soul must be subject. Now, if you are surrendered to God, because that's the context here, beginning in chapter 12, verse 1 of Romans here, it says that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. This is his will. So if I do that, then this is the natural response. And we've been looking at those natural responses to surrender to God. And this is one of them, that you be subject to the governing authorities. So every soul must be governed by the rule of law. That's the bottom line. And that's how most people think. That's the way most people believe. And yet, there are some Christians that will declare to you that they are not subject to the, men, the laws of men. They are only subject to the laws of God. And that is incorrect. The balance of that I will give in just a moment. 
but you are subject to the laws of men. And the Bible declares in 1 Peter chapter 2 that you are to submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. So that's pretty clear. So Paul here is establishing the same concept. Now, why do you do that? He said, because God has appointed them for this purpose, for doing good to protecting you from those who practice evil. So that is one of the fundamental reasons for human government. It's the primary reason for a police force. It's the primary reason for an intelligence service. It's the primary reason for the military. It is they are to are basically to protect us and work for the common good. To resist authority is basically to resist God himself. So this is a very important statement here. And Paul makes that absolutely clear here. So lawbreakers basically are fighting against God himself. Now, Jeremiah, the prophet, when the people of God were taken into captivity, said this to them under the inspiration of the Spirit again. God told the people, seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. So very simple exhortation, but he's saying, look, pray for the peace of your nation. Pray for the peace in your community. Pray for those governing authorities because they are there to protect you. And you should be very thankful for this. He says that they are God's ministers for good. Now, whenever this particular statement is made, many times a Christian will think in his mind, well, what about the evil authorities? What about rulers that are not doing good and are doing evil? I mean, did God appoint Hitler to rule over Germany? Did God appoint Stalin? Did God appoint Pol Pot? I mean, Hitler killed six million Jews. Many other millions of Christians did he kill. Pol Pot, he killed two million Cambodians. He just literally annihilated them. And Stalin, millions more. Mao Zedong, millions more. I mean, you can go th down the record of history and there are some incredibly evil men that have ruled and evil women that have ruled as well. And so you have to ask that question and you have to answer that question. So I don't want to skirt this. This is the, the primary purpose in a general sense is to submit and be subject to the governing authorities. But there are some governing authorities that are evil. And I do not believe that God has appointed them as rulers. Why do I say that? Well, in Hosea chapter 8, verse 4, it says, They set up kings, but not by me. Now, this is God speaking. They set up kings, but not by me. They made princes, but I did not acknowledge them. So it's pretty clear that the Lord is telling the children of Israel, you have set up some incredibly evil men in places of authority, and this is not my directive will. And that's the difference here, is there is a directive will of God, and there is a permissive will of God. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there are certain things that God, yes, specifically directs. There are other things that he permits to take place and he allows to take place, which would follow all of the evil that goes on in this world today. He allows it. 
He does not sanction it. He does not want that to take place. If you think and you come to the belief that every single ruler, no matter who they are, are appointed by God, which I don't think this scripture teaches. I think this scripture is talking about general governing authorities, in general, not specific individuals. If you don't come to that conclusion, then you have to say, well, God is the one who wanted Hitler in power. Well, then you have to make God out to be someone who has ordained evil and to, for someone to do evil. And the Bible is clearly against that. In Psalm 34, verse 16, it says, The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So the face of the Lord was against Adolf Hitler. Are we absolutely clear on that? I, I don't think that there should be any question about that. But not understanding the directive will versus the permissive will of God is a mis will bring you to a, a misunderstanding of this passage. Now, when you read this passage and you come to that conclusion, then you understand many other passages where God speaks about the reason and what results from men's rebellion against him. Let me read to you some of these passages. In Isaiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, here God speaks to the people and he tells them the reason why they're going to have foolish rulers overruling them and governing them. He says, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, takes away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the diviner and the elder, the captain of fifty and the honorable man, the counselor and the skilled artisan, the expert enchanter, I, have, I will give children to be your princes, and babes shall rule over you. Wow, what a statement is that? He says, you're going to have rulers that are just going to, they're going to act like children. They are going to be selfish and self-centered, and they're going to rule over you. Verse 5, he says, the people will be oppressed, everyone by another and everyone by his neighbor which means obviously that the ruler is not taking care of the common good, and which they're supposed to be doing. They just allow basically anybody to do whatever they want. The child will be insolent toward the elder and the base toward the honorable. Now, next verse in Hosea 13, 11. God said, I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. So here he is speaking about Saul, King Saul. And why did he give them this king? Because they had to be like all the rest of the nations of the world. They didn't want the Lord to rule over them anymore. They wanted a king like everyone else. And why did the Lord take this man away? Because of his rebellion and his disobedience to God. Proverbs 28, 2. It says, Because of the transgression of the land, many are its princes. Notice, many are the princes, many are the governing authorities. Why? When you can't keep somebody in office very long as a governing authority, it's because of the transgression of the land. Now, when you look at the end of the history of Israel, they went through ruler after ruler. Some were in power as little as three months. And so they were either assassinated or they were removed by either the Egyptians or the Assyrians or the Babylonians. So this is a reality. This is what the history of Israel was like because of the transgression of the people. So the Lord in his permissive will allows these evil people to rule because of the transgression of the people of the land. So this is, I believe, 
one of the most important concepts that a Christian keeps in balance as they look at this particular issue. Now, is there ever a time when you should resist your government and not be subject to your governing authorities? Yes, absolutely. And again, this is further balance to this particular passage. There are several reasons why you should not be subject to governing authorities and not submit yourself to them and seek to resist them. The first is when you are personally required by law to sin against God or to violate your own conscience. Notice the issue of conscience comes in a little further down in verse 5. He says you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. We'll look at that in more detail in a moment. But if you are commanded by your government to sin against God, against his word, or against your own conscience, then you should not submit. Now, under our form of government, we allow for what we call a conscientious objector. And throughout our history, we have allowed for someone who, for their own conscience sake, they resist, they do not believe that they can do particular things. So this is clearly in our legal system. And it comes from the scripture. So we must yield unless we are commanded by law to sin against God or against his word. Let me give you an example. In Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, there is the story of the king of Egypt. The pharaoh basically came to the Hebrew midwives and said, I want you to kill every male child. Let the females live, but kill every male child. So how did they respond? Notice verse 15. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shipra and the name of the other Pura. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women, see them on their, and you see them on their birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. If, he, if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them and saved the male children alive. This is why Moses was saved alive and many of the other children. So clearly here, the Bible shows that this, was, this command of the governing authorities at that time was not obeyed. Why? Because they feared God. There is a higher law than the law of man. A second reason is if you are required to worship a false god. This probably is best seen in the story in Daniel chapter 3. The entire chapter there is given over to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were commanded to bow down to a false god. If they did not, they were under penalty of death. They chose rather to die, and they chose to resist. Great example. A third example is if you are commanded not to preach the gospel anymore. This took place in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. Here's Peter's response to the commands of those in authority that said you shall not preach in the name of Jesus anymore. His response was we ought to obey God rather than men. So these are the examples that are given. Now, how should you respond? Well, you should first try and use every legal means that is within your power to change the command that has been given to you. You need to use the legal system that we have. And that is always first. Now, if you look at the colonists of this particular country and you read the history of the United States, you will realize that that's exactly what our founding fathers did for many, many years 
prior to the Declaration of Independence. They were sending and asking for legislation. They were in the court system. They were sending emissaries to King George. They were doing everything in their power to seek redress of their grievances through the legal system. And so that is always number one because that is the way you show your submission to the governing authorities. So why did they declare independence? Was that right? You will talk to Christians, some Christians that say it was wrong for them to have done this because it disobeyed this direct command here in Romans 13. I don't believe that that's correct. I don't believe that's correct because they had a right to de declare their independence from England because of the many grievances that they had. Now, most of you from your history classes, you probably know about one of those grievances. It's called no, uh, no taxation without representation. That was one of 27 grievances listed in the Declaration of Independence. When's the last time you ever read the Declaration of Independence? I, I hope that you read it on a regular basis. It, it's very inspiring, it really is. It, it's inspiring in the sense of giving you an understanding of the balance of this concept. Now, if you go through those 27 grievances, you will find that they declared independence because the King of England sent troops to be quartered here in our country in peacetime to control people and take away their rights. Then we have what's called the Boston Massacre. That was only one of the more important killing of people with no redress, no justice. I think there were two individuals that were convicted of manslaughter for that killing of the five individuals in the Boston Massacre. And you know what they got for punishment? They didn't go to jail. They didn't get anything but a brand on their hand, a branding that they were a, a manslayer. That's it. And let go. As you look at these grievances, you realize that they continually sent letters to King George. He refused to pass any laws that would protect the citizens of this country. He impressed and took citizens of the United States on the high seas and forced them to go into the, the British Navy to fight against the people here in this country. And so basically, he generally oppressed this country. So this is the reason why the colonists declared independence, which was a right thing to do because of the, well, the complete disregard for the common good of our country. And so this is a balance that I think is, is so important to see. Now, the second thing that Paul describes here in verses 3 and 4 is that he says you must be subject to governments, to governing authorities, because they protect you from evildoers, those who practice evil. Now, notice that he declares that in the end of verse 4 that they are God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So people that are living in our country who practice evil, well, that's why we have a government. That's why we have a governing authorities. That's why we have a police force. That's why we have a military. Because they are established to protect us from those that would do evil from within, and those that would try and do evil to us from without. And if you're a, a pacifist and you say to yourself, well, we don't need a military. Do you know the first thing that would take place if we disbanded our military and just took all of our weapons and burned them? We would be overrun. We would be taken over. Because there are people that would love 
to do that, that are evil rulers. And so that's just not reality. And that is why God set up human government. And so this is what gives a police force the right to deadly force. This is the, right, the reason why we should have the right to capital punishment. This is the reason why we could and should wage a just war. Now, yes, there are unjust wars. I'd agree with you. There are times when a country should not go to war. But there are times when a country must go to war. There is a, a necessity, I believe, for capital punishment. And there is a necessity for deadly force as well. Notice he says here that this individual in the middle of verse 4, he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. You can't say it any clearer than that. Now, again, there are those believers that say, you know what, we should not have any police force. We should not have capital punishment. That is so cruel. That is so barbaric. We should never have such a thing. My problem is that if, that if capital punishment is cruel and unusual punishment, the guys that wrote our Constitution, they're the ones that wrote about cruel and unusual punishment. They didn't think capital punishment was cruel and unusual because they're the ones that put it in our laws. And then, yet, there are those that say, well, this is a violation, Steve, of the Sixth Commandment. Thou shalt not kill. But that is a misunderstanding of Scripture. That commandment actually is, thou shalt not murder. It has nothing to do with civil justice. It has everything to do with personal vengeance, which we are commanded not to do, in the previous verses here in Romans 12, here at the end of this passage. So the balance here is very important. If you don't see these, these passages in the context, then you will misunderstand them. There is a big difference between mercy, uh, murder and the justice of capital punishment. A big difference between a personal act of revenge out of hatred or greed and civil justice, which is motivated by righteousness and the protection of our society. Now, there are issues that I think are very difficult, but these principles, I think, are very clear and would be very helpful to understand. Notice in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22, Notice what the Lord says here concerning the understanding that his people had about what real justice was. The further away our nation gets from what true justice is, they get further away from the word of God, the Judeo-Christian ethic upon which this country was founded, the less understanding and reality a person has to make good judgments about what is just and what is righteous. Notice he says here in Jeremiah 4.22, this is as a result of the rebellion and the rejection of God's word. God says here, for my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are silly children. They have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, and to do good they have no knowledge. And I believe that really is where the general population is today here in the United States. A lot of silly children, and a lot of our governing officials are just as silly, just as foolish, because they think they can make decisions that don't have consequences upon our nation. I I look at some of the decisions that are made in our capital today, and nobody in this room would ever be able to spend money like they do, because you would go into bankruptcy if you did. 
You would lose your house if you did. You would end up being homeless if you did. And yet, people make these decisions every single day. And I, I just shake my head because we're going to have to pay the piper as a country one day soon. It's coming. And I, I pray our nation will wake up because they're a bunch of silly children. And if you don't vote them out of there, they are going to stay there and make foolish decisions more and more. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, God says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. In other words, their, their idea of what righteousness is, what good is, is completely against and opposite to what real evil is and what real good is. Their view is backwards, in other words. So that's where people go away from God's truth. That's where they go. They come to a place of foolishness. And they make decisions that have great ramifications for us. Now, if you are against capital punishment, do you realize that there is an eternal capital punishment stated by Jesus Christ? It says in Matthew 25, verse 46, Jesus said, These will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, you know, both of those words, everlasting and eternal, are the exact same Greek word. They mean the same thing. If you believe that there is eternal life, then you have got to come to the conclusion that there is the everlasting punishment. And, you know, people always say, well, Jesus, he's so nice, he's so loving. But Jesus is the one who said this. There are two ends. There is a resurrection of the unjust and a resurrection of the just. There is a resurrection to punishment. There is a resurrection to eternal life. And so you get to make that decision which resurrection you will be in. But those are the only options. So if you're against capital punishment, then you have to be against the eternal capital punishment that God states in his word. If you say, well, I don't think we should ever go to war. I don't think we should ever have a military. Do you realize that the Bible calls Jesus a man of war? It says in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, John said, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on it was called faithful and true. In righteousness he judges and makes war. You see, the first time Jesus came to this earth, he came in humility. The second time he comes to this earth, he is coming in righteousness to judge and make war. And he is going to set up his kingdom here upon the earth. And the Bible says that he will rule this earth with a rod of righteousness, a rod of iron. And anybody that violates that will be dealt with swiftly. So you need to have this balance in your thinking. Don't be swayed by the common culture today and by the mores and the values of our society today. Let your thinking be governed by God's word. When I first came to Christ, I was a pacifist, a complete pacifist. As I read God's word, I came to realize I was wrong. And this is a righteous, right thing. We need it if we are going to live in a civilized society. We must have it if we are. Now, the third issue that Paul brings up here is in verse 5. He says, be subject for conscience sake, not fear. Now, this is a very important principle because... Your conscience is what motivates you to live by a higher standard than the law of man. The law of God is a higher standard. And your conscience 
should be the one motivating you to do what is right. This is what Paul said in Acts 24, 16. He said, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Notice, both of those. I want to have a conscience void of offense toward God and men. This is an essential thing if we are going to be subject to governing authorities. I've got to be governed by my conscience. And my conscience, many times, is what tells me that I am not being subject. I am not subject to the governing authorities. Now, probably the best way to, to understand this is a simple illustration that probably every one of us in this room has had occurred to them. You're driving down the freeway, you're driving a little fast, and you're looking in the rearview mirror constantly to see whether the CHP is behind you or not. You're looking down the roads to see if there's any of them hiding behind a tree. That should tell you right off the bat you're doing something that is against your conscience. Now, I remember one time I was driving down the road probably 75 miles an hour at least. I was singing and I was praising and I was just worshiping the Lord and I just, I had no idea how fast I was going until I saw the red lights in my rearview mirror. And then I realized, oh, I guess I should be a little more concerned about my speed. And I got a ticket. So, a right thing. I think one of the greatest inventions known to man in our cars today is cruise control. <laughs> because if you don't want to have to worry about who's in your rearview mirror, just push the button. That's it. I, I love cruise control because you can just push it and I don't have to worry about somebody coming after me. I can sing and fellowship all I want and not be worried about it. So your conscience is really got to be your guide. And that, that little phrase, let your conscience be your guide, is a very clear biblical concept. And so walk there. Set the cruise control and rest. Now fourth and last here in verses 6 and 7, he says you should be subject to the governing authorities because they are constantly working for your good and that is the reason why you should be paying taxes or custom or what, whichever. Now, there is a large sec segment of the church today that believes that you should not pay your taxes. I, I bet you you have talked to one of them at some time. I have. They've, they've confronted me before. And I don't see how someone gets that concept when the Bible states very clearly here in verse 6, for because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's minister. So he says it again, a third time. They're God's ministers. So this is the reason why you pay taxes. So how can someone get this out of the Bible and say the Bible teaches that you shouldn't do this when it states this so clearly? Now, I would agree with you, yes, take every legal deduction possible. But after that, you need to pay your taxes. And you need to be honest on your taxes. Because do you realize that Jesus paid taxes? Very clearly. In Matthew 17, 27, this is when one uh, of the people came and asked Peter, he says, Peter, does your master pay taxes? And he came to Jesus, asked Jesus, do we pay taxes? He wasn't quite sure. And Matthew 17, 27 says this, Jesus said, nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, take the fish that comes up first, and when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for who? For me and you. Now, I would love to be able to go fishing and come up with this kind of a deal. 
because this would, this would really be a good trick, wouldn't it? I, I, I love to fish, so this would be a double, a double blessing. But the normal way we pay taxes, this is a miracle, obviously, and it was a miracle to, to demonstrate to Peter that the Lord could provide any way. And so, but for us, we work so that we can pay our taxes. And so when a person is violating that and not paying taxes, uh, not paying their employees' taxes, that's, let your conscience be your guide. It's, it's something that will come back to bite you one day. I believe that this is the reason why we are to pay our taxes is to support those that are taking care of us and protecting us. And I sure am glad when we have had to call the police at our home or at this church, most of the time they are here within two or three minutes. And I'll tell you, if, if you ever have the occasion to call the police and they come, you're going to be awful thankful you paid your taxes because they're going to protect you. And I, I hope that you realize that. This is the same reason the Bible gives for supporting the church as well. Because just like governing authorities are continually about taking care of the important things for the common good of our nation and our community, so there are people that are working continuously for your spiritual good as well. A very interesting passage in Second Chronicles 31, verses 4 through 8. I'll just read the first verse. He says there, Moreover, he, referring to Hezekiah, commanded the people who dwelt in Jerusalem to contribute support for the priests and the Levites that they might devote themselves to the law of the Lord. And that is the purpose. That is the reason. So, this particular principle as well was taken into the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where Paul explains the reason why we should support our local congregation and a local church. So I hope that this gives you balance in your mind. And if there is a redress of your problem, your issue, go through the legal channels to do it. If not, and if you are commanded to sin against God, against your own conscience, do something that is directly contrary to God's word, then you are responsible to the Lord not to do that. Amen. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we ask that today you would, Lord, give us a heart that has a true balance of understanding these passages. And Lord, we ask that you would give us a heart and a willingness to be subject to the governing authorities. Lord, I pray that you would help us to pray for them. Lord, help us to vote and to vote with righteousness in mind and what is truly right for our nation, what's best for our community. And Lord, I pray that today, Lord, you would, you would touch the governing authorities of our land. We take this opportunity and we pray for our nation. We pray for those that are making the laws. And Lord, I pray that you would bring conviction upon their souls, that you would show them the foolishness, the silliness of the decisions they have made to this point. And Lord, I pray that you would turn them around and if not, Lord, we ask you to remove them. And Lord, we pray that our nation would awaken to what is true, what is right, what is just, what is righteous. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be that influence in our families, in our workplaces. Lord, help us to speak up for righteousness and for truth, for what is just. Lord, we believe you to do that. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, you're, you're not a Christian. You've never made that commitment to surrender your life. 
If you want God's governance in your life, then you need to submit to him. You need to first bow your knee to him and receive Christ into your life personally. You do that through prayer. You do that by just asking. Jesus promised, he said, if you ask, it will be given. So if you want forgiveness of your sins, just ask him this morning. If you want Christ to rule inside of you, ask him right now. Let me lead you. Let me lead you in prayer. Just say these words to to the Lord in your heart. Just say, God, I am a sinner. I have broken your law. Forgive me. Jesus, come in. Take over my life right now. I want you to govern my life. Did you just pray with me? If you did, I want you to acknowledge that you prayed with me by just lifting your hand here. Simple acknowledgement. Yes, Steve, I prayed with you this morning. Anyone here? We'd like to pray for you. Father, we give you praise today. We thank you for, Lord, your leadership, your guidance, your direction in our lives. We surrender to you this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.